Hello and welcome to episode 48 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. It is dark December. Not a month I named after myself, but a descriptive title for this time of year. It's not cold. December doesn't ever seem to be really cold, but there is a certain lack of light about. At work on the edge of the children's, all of the tender plants have now been put away in their frost-free places for storage. But here in London, where I live and where I'm recording this, my canners are still out in the garden and show no sign of being affected by this weather whatsoever. I'm certainly not going to move them anywhere. I think it would take a freakishly cold blast to, to get rid of them in their sheltered position in a, in a hedgerow border here. I think that this has generally been quite a mild autumn, but then autumns do seem to be mild these days. They, there was something I was reading in Horticulture Week this week. The autumn is the season most affected by the changes in the climate. The, the build-up of warm, wet air over the late summer months seems to hang around for longer, causing all sorts of wonderful, exotic fungal diseases. I was also reading in Horticultural Week that the Ponicetias might be several centimetres shorter this year than we're used to, due to one of the big German suppliers being found with an exotic variant of whitefly and having all of their, their imports banned. So we're having to grow our own Ponicetias, and that means we're three weeks behind. So come Christmas Day, those, those red leaf things will only be the size of, of last year's December the 6th Ponicetia. That is, unless we are all treated to some sort of Christmas miracle. I think this is a good time of year to, to be doing less gardening and more reading. As well as Horticulture Week, I've been reading a lot of Gertrude Jekyll, the original and best gardening pundit. And she is fantastic. There's a reason why her, her name remains, and it's not just for the, for the Arts and Crafts Gardens. She was incredibly perceptive. She's particularly brilliant, I think, on the relationship between the hard landscaping and the garden and the house. She's always recommending, well, you can't have that plant there. It has no dignity. It has no stature. How can that little begonia hope to compete with the architectural quality of your house, sir? She's also incredibly dismissive of the imaginative powers of the professional gardener, of which I am one. And she, she believes that a professional gardener with his narrow training, his small mind, and his generally low level of intelligence will never create anything truly beautiful. Unless, unless he is taken under the wing of a truly artistic, aristocratic owner, someone who has travelled the world, who has seen ruined castles and the sun rising over Marrakesh. This is the kind of person who might just be able to, to open the mind of that staid and stolid man that is the, the paid garden labourer, and with him create something beautiful. I know this will cause a great deal of offence to, to many people, many of my friends who are, who are professional gardeners, but I think there is some truth in what she's saying, and I don't think she's saying well, she was at the time, of course she was, she was incredibly class conscious, and at the time she was saying that there was a higher class of imagination amongst wealthier people. But I think the point behind it was that to create a garden truly spectacular, truly unique, and a garden that, that, that said something in a world of crowded gardens, one needed to be connected to it in a way that almost only came with, with owning the land and with having lived a life before coming to it. She believed that the best gardens were created by those in their, in their 40s who had spent their time arsing around, who had made their money or published their books and now were looking to, to mould the land around them into something really beautiful. That's what I've been doing in, in my lunch breaks and in the enforced breaks caused by torrential downpours this week, going through old, old Gertrude Jekyll books and picking the best bits out of them. I have been doing some gardening as well. I planted up a, a new little border, a little border next to a hedge, a little border for winter. I've also been harvesting some of the last of the autumn fruit and getting on with a bit more mulching. Enough of Gertrude Jekyll rhymes with treacle. Let's get on with the week in gardening. On 
Monday, I planted up a new little winter garden. And this is a cheerful little winter garden. It sits about six or seven meters away from the, the front door over a patch of gravel and it is therefore a greetings border. It is the border that reassures you that the world is full of beauty. No matter what you might have heard on the Today programme that morning, step outside the door and forget John Humphreys. Look at these winter flowers. As a structural architectural plant, which is, is the core of a winter garden, you can't just have, just have flowers. You need something evergreen to hold them together. I use Dianella, which is a plant I've not put in a garden before. Dianella looks like a flax. It's got those spiky evergreen flax-like leaves in a, in a green that is, is a dull glaucus. It's the kind of, it's almost a toady, a bluish toady colour. It's not viridian, it's not vibrant green. And it is beautiful for its shape and the upright nature of its, le its leaves. Some of the, the people who were passing by as I was planting it said, oh, are those clumps of daffodils? Because it really does look like a clump of large daffodils. The daffodils that flower at about 30 or 40 centimetres. And at the stage when they're not really sending up the flower spike yet, but they've got their leaves in full growth when they're that wonderful, vigorous, upright clump. Looks like a badger hair shaving brush coming out of the ground. They look like that. Anyway, I've used them interspersed with, with quite large, pale rocks and small, small hellebores. They're the hellebore Christmas carol with the, the white flowers. And then a lot of cyclamen hydrofolium, the, the cyclamen with the ivy leaf, that beautiful, beautiful veined ornamental leaf, which are mostly finished flowering now. They're there to give the ground that exotic scaled effect as if it were the most bright and brilliant ornamental lizard in some taxidermist's collection. And the ground around these plants has been absolutely stuffed full of daffodils, which are the cheeriest of spring flowers. I know that every flower of spring has its own cheer, but my goodness, you can't beat that infusion of yellow. Interestingly, Horticulture Week, you might, you might realise from this episode that I've just renewed my subscription to, to Horticulture Week. It's a monthly magazine now, but anyway, Horticulture Week was trying to link Amal Clooney's dress at the recent uh, royal wedding to trends in, in plants that we're all going to be going for next year. And I don't, I don't know if it's true, I don't know if subconsciously this brilliant, by all accounts, dress has influenced the way I'm going to garden in 2019. It might have done. Anyway, there's going to be lots and lots of, of yellow, cluny coloured daffodils. And then in the middle of that, it hasn't, hasn't arrived yet, but it's on order, I've got a prunus, a prunus shirote, which is one of those magnificent white spreading almost umbrella shaped prunus the the canopy goes out as far as it goes up and forms forms a wonderful dome shape when it's mature but i've ordered a multi-stem version of those at about three meters it's a nice it's a nice plant it's a it's a 400 quid plant so it's going to be it's going to be quite spectacular i hope for that real explosion of, of spring colour, even if even if it doesn't last long, and, and cherry blossom doesn't tend to last particularly long, but it's like teenage love, it's all the better for its brevity and the intensity of it. So I'm very excited about that. That, that should arrive next week, and I'm sure you'll hear all about the planting in next week's episode. In order to plant it, I'll probably have to dig out a few of the things I planted already, but I wanted I wanted to to get the, the impression of the finished border in place even if it means that I will have to to do some extra work around it and it was very lucky that this work was done on Monday because Monday was by far the best working day of last week Tuesday was freezing cold in the morning the temperature must have dropped about minus three where we were judging by the 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 level of ground frost well maybe not quite level minus three but it was it was cold anyway it was lawn damaging cold which meant that it's quite hard to to find jobs to work on you can only really work from the hard standing you don't want to be going around breaking frozen grass stems because that leads to even more nasty fungal diseases than we're already harboring we, we blew some leaves off the bits that that still had leaves on them and were still hard enough to walk on and then went harvesting harvesting medlars I talked at great length last year about my introduction to the world of medlars. 
how I was training myself to get over the innate human revulsion in biting into something mushy and seemingly rotten and just appreciate the taste. And my goodness, I've got over that now. I am addicted. It must be like committing some, some horrible and taboo crime. The first time you do it, you feel just wrong and guilty, but, but maybe a thrill of excitement. And later it becomes, becomes normal, and you have to have it. You can't get enough of it. And so, so we, we were harvesting medlars, my, my colleague and I, in order to have a medlar jelly competition. The idea being that we harvest the medlars and make medlar jelly. And then we come in and, and one of us wins and we claim bragging rights. And whoever doesn't win still has a load of jars of medlar jelly to, to gift to people at Christmas. Unfortunately, if you are one of my relatives, you might not be receiving medlar jelly from me this year. I'm sorry to say, because I ate all of my medlars as they were sitting in a carrier bag waiting for me to take them home on Friday. Throughout the week, I, I was just, uh, just squishing them down. Anyway, the medlar jellies, it's quite interesting. The recipes I found call for a mixture of bletted, bletted is the technical term for turned to off-putting mush, and unbletted medlars, because the unbletted medlars contain the pectin, which will set the jelly into a jelly and, and not a, a sugary medlar soup. I'll try again next week, try to harvest more medlars and, and refrain from eating them. I saw also recently, they've been talking about I'm Ready For, that that marshmallow test, that, that mellow, marshmallow test where if a child can restrain themselves from eating everything in front of them immediately, it is a great predictor of future success. Well, they have not been able to replicate that. So I think that, that my lack of self-restraint isn't something that's going to, going to hold me back in my future career as a marshmallow hoarder. Anyway, that was Tuesday. And then from there on in, it got very wet. It got Don the Southwesters and just survive kind of wet. It's been, it's been a wet end to November and early December. The ground is now saturated. It's like a overfilled sponge. One single press on it squidges water out elsewhere. We have a heavy clay soil and it does hold onto water. Except it's not like a sponge. It's like a sponge that you step on and it squeezes out water and then also smears. It's very nasty. Unfortunately, it's also, it's also mild enough that the grass is still growing a little bit. I'd like to get one last cut done. One of those pre-Christmas cuts where you cut on the 20th or the 22nd. But if it stays this wet, that's just going to lead to a horrendous, slidey mud smear across the lawns. So much of gardening is, is picking your moment. It's like pulling into a roundabout, a very busy roundabout full of speeding cars, except the cars are weather events and you have to judge the, the gap between them. Anyway, certainly no lawn cutting for me on Wednesday. Instead, we did some looking through designs for next year and thinking of ideas, things that we might build and put in place and changes that might be made to, to the garden in horticultural terms and organisational terms, all those necessary conversations that, that one must have. We haven't quite reached that stage yet, but December is a very good time for sitting back and reflecting, or just, just sitting back drunk in a deep and comfy armchair and telling people that you are, you are reflecting, not, not comatose. So I will be doing some of that later on. I'll probably give a, a year in review episode of the podcast. And then it was Thursday, and I was off doing the Masters, the Masters in Garden History. It was a very interesting session, because I was hearing from my brilliant and bright fellow course mates about their research projects, this, this long 5,000-word essay that's had them all in the archives, trying to find out the history of various incredibly diverse gardens. It's amazing what there is to research out there. This subject has not even been scraped. We all gave short presentations on where we'd reached and what we might do next in terms of garden research. My, mine's quite interesting. I haven't mentioned it on the podcast yet. I'm going to do the history of this little square, a pretty nondescript square, Georgian Square in London. Not, a, not too, many, too many minutes walk from Bloomsbury, where the Masters is based. And I've managed to find in the, in the archives some log books and account books for this garden during the, the Victorian period up to the period just after the Second World War. 
So I've got quite a good account of these things. And it's run by this incredibly humorless bunch of trustees. They do brilliant things in their, in their minutes, like the treasurer has been filling us in on his correspondence with the board of the National Hospital for the Paralyzed and Epileptic. They are building a new wing and have asked our permission to host a garden party in the grounds. We have said no. They also do great things like, I think at one stage they find out that they're underpaying their gardener. And this is brought up in, in their meeting. And the resolution is that they will not tell him, they will not give him a pay rise, but if he asks for a pay rise, they authorise one to be given. I'm sure a lot of us gardeners are treated like this. I wonder, I wonder how many of you professional gardeners listening have asked for a pay rise this year. Maybe, maybe you should. Maybe the funds are in place for you. Anyway, that was Thursday. A nice bit of intellectual fun before going back to the very wet garden. Friday started utterly torrential. Well, it wasn't torrential. It wasn't even the joy of torrential. It's almost habitual now. We're just so used to it. The grounds, the sky, the everything is wet. I went in wellies and raincoats and waterproof trousers and washed up the compost area, washed down the digger, gave it a good polish, washed away all of the compost that had been spread by our feet over the course of the week in filtering and, and getting mulch ready for the beds. And by about 11 o'clock, the sun broke through. I'm not going to pretend that the afternoon was, was bathed in glorious sunshine, but it was dry enough to get out and do some planting from on the boards. So that's laying a scaffolding board down so you don't compact the soil and turn it into a slab of mud. It's like when you're baking a cake and you have to fold ingredients in slowly so you don't lose the air that you've generated in whatever egg mixture you're using. If you stand on soil when it's this wet, you can do serious damage to the structure by compressing it too much and turning it into an airless squidge. And I planted some, some bulbs, I planted the camassia that I'd been talking about when I did the big planting for the winter garden. The white camassia that's going to flower up between that very elegant Fatsia polycarpa and the, the fetid hellebore and the holly-leafed hellebore. So we put in, put in a couple of hundred of those, so it should look quite spectacular. I was talking to a horticultural journalist the other day about Camassia, talking about how they were going to be big in Chelsea Flower Show last year because lots of people were using them in the designs they'd sent out in the, in the press pre-releases. And then we got the beast from the east and it was so cold that no one's Camassia had, had come out. But there were all these stories on file, all of these Camassia tales about Harvey Brooks is using Camassia in this scheme and that scheme, and they, they had to be binned. So hopefully we'll have more of a, a Camassia year and everyone will be talking about them when my Camassias are coming out and I can join in sharing photos of them. Anyway, that's something to look forward to, to May and Chelsea Flower Show time. And that was it, the end of another week, a wet week, but mild. We put down some grass seed about, we must have put it down three weeks ago, which is normally far too late for, for grass seed, but it's all germinated. The ground now has that sheen of new grass green on it. That shows how, how gently this autumn is treating us so far. Right, let's see if I have any recommendations and boasting to do this week. recommendations this week are sort of sort of allied to a, a little bit of a boast. I didn't tell you, but a week ago on Thursday, I won an award and I won the Alan Titchmarsh New Talent Award at the Garden Media Guild Awards, which was very nice. It was in the Savoy in that room that they use at the end of the film Notting Hill when he rushes into the press conference. It's one of those rooms with mirrors and and blue panelling on the walls. Very nice very different from the potting shed and compost heap. And Alan was very nice and gave me this, this lovely flower pot. And all sorts of other people were celebrated, all sorts of people far worthier than me. 
So this is kind of a catch-all for garden media recommendations. If you feel you want to listen to something or read something or look at something garden related this Christmas period, then go to the Garden Media Guild Awards website. Just search Garden Media Guild Awards and you'll find all of the people who were shortlisted in all of the categories. There are writers of brilliant books and there are all sorts of fantastic photographers. There are podcasters. You'll go and find some other podcasters who were shortlisted and won the, the podcast category. It really is a good, a good summary of who was publishing decent things between October of 2017 and October of 2018. You can also see a picture of me having received my award, looking very, very awkward indeed. I showed it to one of my friends. I haven't showed it to too many because it's quite an embarrassing photo. I don't look very good. And they said that it actually it's a very good advert for a gardener because I look exactly like someone who's been hauled out of the great outdoors and shoved into a suit, put on a seat and made to, made to be awkward in public. I did have a wonderful night and it was, it was lovely to meet so many other horticultural people. I also recommend getting back into your jekyll over winter. I think Wooden Garden is one of her better books. So maybe maybe start with that one. All of the all of the jekyll books can be read online. The experience isn't quite right. It's not the, the cozy comfortable thing it should be reading on a computer screen. But if you go to archive.org and search for scanned copies or PDFs or EPUB files of every one of her 14 books. The other one that's really good if you are thinking about doing some garden redesign is her book about walls and steps, basically water features and building in the gardens. She is far better than any of the modern landscaping books that I've read because she's able to see how they, they relate to the rest of the garden in a way that, that many people can't. I've also been reading some William Morris on gardening. William Morris didn't write a great deal about gardening. Uh, but he, he did he did include it, seemed to write about everything else. This is related to, to Jekyll and the Arts and Crafts movement. But I thought that it was quite nice what he thought about carpet bedding. He wrote, Another thing, also much too commonly seen, is an aberration of the human mind, which otherwise I should have been ashamed to warn you of. It is technically called carpet gardening. Need I explain it further? I had rather not. For when I think of it, even when I am quite alone, I blush with shame at the thought. So there we go, we have, we have William Morris blushing, blushing even at the thought of, of the begonias being planted out in their nice little rows. You can find all of William Morris's stuff on archive.org as well, if you are so inclined. That's enough from me. Slightly light on horticultural accomplishments this week. That was mainly due to the weather. It is it is the nature of our profession that, that some weeks will be productive and others we will sit in a tarpaulin and listen to the rain drum over our heads. Which is part of the, the charm and joy of gardening. It's what keeps us tied to the, the, the spinning planet. This is not a, a call centre. It's not an office. It is something affected by, by humidity and low pressure and everything else going on in the world. If you are not working to a, to a strict and unreachable deadline, there is a joy in enforced stillness and extended tea breaks. Anyway, I don't know if you're listening to this on a, an enforced break from anything, perhaps while you're doing something, uh, do let me know. You can get in contact with me at thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com or you can find me on Twitter at Ben's Garden or Instagram at Gardener Dark. I always enjoy hearing from people who listen to the podcast and send me send me a, a picture of your garden or a question you need answering and I'll, I'll do my best to get back to you. Thank you very much for listening. And until next week, goodbye. Mm -hmm.